it has taken at least two billion years to create, is a mile deep, sometimes 18 miles wide, and is one of the great wonders of the world. It was formed by the Colorado River, which, like a saw, has carved the canyon through sediments and volcanic rock. Together with rain and wind and time, nature has given us these awe-inspiring formations. This is the Grand Canyon. Each year, more than four million of us come to marvel at the Grand Canyon, making this by far the most popular tourist attraction here in Arizona and one of our busiest national parks. Hi, I'm Linda Lewis. And I'm Christopher Lewis, along with our niece. Laura Tyler. And our nephew. Brian Tyler. <laughs> welcoming you to another exciting side-by-side -side program. And this time, we're going to vacation in the canyon, the same way the early visitors did by train. Right now, we're about 65 miles south of the Grand Canyon at Williams, Arizona, where passengers on the old Santa Fe Railroad used to change trains and head north on a branch line into the Grand Canyon. Now, that was long before the days of interstate highways and air conditionings when trains were what, Brian? The way to travel. That's right, they were. <laughs> and this whole area was a remote outpost only for the adventurous few. So come on along with us and relive the Grand old days at the Grand Canyon as we board the reborn Grand Canyon Railroad to see how an old train is helping to preserve the ecology. Also on the show, we're going to take a mule ride down the canyon walls to see how the original miners lived here back in the 1800s. And we're going to take a helicopter ride above the canyon for a bird's eye view of the park. Plus a look at the ancient Tusian ruins of Arizona. All that and a whole lot more coming up on Side by Side. So come on, guys. Let's I'm ready. Let's board the train. Skies will be sunny if we travel along, singing a song side by side. Well, we don't know what's coming tomorrow, but there'll be no trouble and sorrow if we travel along, singing a song side by side. If we travel along, singing a song side by side. It's been nearly 40 years since steam locomotives plied these rails to the Grand Canyon, and now they're back. The old Santa Fe station in Williams had been closed for a long time when, in 1989, Phoenix entrepreneur Max Bygard invested $80 million, bought five classic steam locomotives that date back to 1906, and reopened the branch line into the canyon. Today, devoted railroaders have pumped new life into the line. And that means breathing new life into steamers that are more than 80 years old. It's not an easy job. Just ask Russ Fisher. It's quite a bit of work. Uh, we have to pretty much completely tear the engine apart and rebuild it from the ground up. And it's amazing. What is, what is the lure or the attraction of a steam engine? I mean, there seems to be something about a steam engine that people just love the sound of, the feel of. You find that? Well, first of all, they're very old. And I think people are interested in machinery, and it's something that's kind of fascinating. You can look at it and watch it work and try to figure out what makes it work. Here in Williams is one of the only places where that you actually rebuild these old steam locomotives. What, what does it take to do it? Uh, there are very few places that do the kind of work that we do here. Um, we have uh, different crews that do different things on the engines. It takes machinists to do all the work on the running gear and drivers and the bearings and everything and a completely separate boiler crew that rebuilds the boiler. What does it make you feel like being a part of the revitalization of this line and really bringing back steam power to the railroads? Well, I've been interested in this since I was a kid, and I've always enjoyed railroads and been interested in steam particularly. And uh, I like to be able to, to show people what these things are like, and it's, it's a fascinating job to me. Think they're neat, Brian? Oh, yeah. You want to go ride one? Oh, yeah. Okay, I think it's time we go. All aboard! It almost seems like 1901, September the 18th to be exact, when Santa Fe engineer Harry Schlee eased the first passenger train along these very same rails. That train ride would change the course of the canyon forever because it was the railroad that made the canyon accessible to tourists.
There it is, the quaint little Grand Canyon Station, one of the first sights the early tourists saw when they arrived here by train. It's not far from the famous El Tobar Hotel, which we're going to visit in a moment. Remember, we're following in the footsteps now of those early tourists. So stay right there. When we return, we'll see why this canyon has become so popular over the years. And we're going to find out how some people are trying to keep the canyon in its natural state. So don't you go away. Wait, Come on, you guys. Let's go. Welcome back on Side by Side. Chris and Linda Lewis touring the Grand Canyon with our niece and Brian, our nephew, over here. And this is the El Tovar Hotel, just a stone's throw from the train station at the rim of the canyon. It was designed by the famous architect Charles Whittlesley and built by the Santa Fe Railroad in 1905 and was meant to combine the qualities of a Swiss chalet and a Norwegian villa. And what it did was to introduce luxury to the Grand Canyon. And you know, Laura, back in the old days, everybody stayed here. And they still do. I think you're right. Named after a Spanish army officer of the explorer Coronado, the hotel was the showplace of the famous Fred Harvey chain, where fine china, crystal, and spotless linen were matched only by the exquisite oak and leather furniture. But the hotel was only a pale preview of the canyon that lay below. Archaeologists speculate that the Paleo-Indians were the first to settle here about 11,000 years ago. They were followed by other tribes until finally the Navajo arrived on the eastern side of the canyon about 600 years ago. Ranger Marsha Phillips takes visitors on walks along the canyon's rim and explains that human history fails by comparison with the time and forces it took to form the canyon. Has anyone ever been to the magnificent Grand Canyon of Iowa? <laughs> no. It is a tremendous canyon. It is just as deep, and the rocks are the same rocks, layered horizontal rocks going downwards from the top level, downwards for thousands of feet. The only problem with the Grand Canyon of Iowa is it is filled up to the very top with rock. <laughs> now, the point I'm making, then, is that the rock layers of the Grand Canyon area and the rock layers of Iowa are the same. Now, I don't mean the exact same rock layers. I mean that they're flat and horizontal and that there are many thousands of feet of flat horizontal rock. The difference between Iowa and here is that here the rocks have this tremendous hole out here. Do you get a sense that this is one of the biggest holes in the ground that you have ever seen in your life? Yes. The first documented exploration of the canyon wasn't until 1869 when John Wesley Powell, a one-armed Civil War veteran, led a daring boat expedition down the Colorado in a remarkable 98 days. It was a fateful trip, as Brian and I found out when we sat down with Earl Kingston, an actor who brings the character of Powell to life. I was a scientist. The Colorado River through the Grand Canyon was the last unexplored part of the United States. And I wanted to find out what was there, what it looked like, what the rocks looked like, how, how fast the river got from up in the mountains down to sea level. So I got together a whole lot of men and uh, we started way up on the Green River in Wyoming. And we didn't know what we were going to find. We didn't know what it was going to be like. We didn't know anything about what they call whitewater rafting now. <laughs> didn't even have rafts. We had these big old wooden boats. We set off, and as soon as we got down into the river, we said, uh-oh, we're in trouble here. <laughs> and we were. We were in some trouble right away. We lost some men. We lost one of the boats. We had food that was like we were collecting fossils in the food after a while just started to look like our fossils we couldn't tell the difference despite all the bad things that have happened to you are you happy you discovered the grand canyon i sure am brian i do it again tomorrow it's the greatest experience of my life what an idea coming around a bend and seeing all that for the first time i'm going to come back and tell people about it Prospectors followed Powell into the canyon with dreams of instant wealth, but the rugged terrain made large-scale mining impractical. However, the winding trails and treacherous switchbacks they left behind became the basis of the biggest industry here, tourism. Now, by the time the railroad arrived, the hotel was built and tourists began discovering the Grand Canyon. President Theodore Roosevelt declared the canyon a national monument. 
That was back on January 11, 1908. It was on February 26, 1919 that President Woodrow Wilson signed a bill creating the Grand Canyon National Park. Now stay right there. We'll be back after this break. Isn't it fun? Discover the hidden beauty of the Grand Canyon on the wings of a butterfly. Papillon Grand Canyon Helicopters. For reservations, call 1-800-528-2418. Welcome back on Side by Side, touring the Grand Canyon on a family vacation with Laura and Brian. Right now, we're just outside the park about to see the Grand Canyon like no early <laughs> visitor ever got a chance to. That's right, Laura. We're going to take to the sky for a view of one of the great natural wonders of the world. So why don't you come along what with us? What a good idea, All Brian. Right. Grand Canyon Helicopters has been taking visitors over the canyon for years now, and as pilot David Jarrett will tell you, this is a thrill of a lifetime you'll never get tired of. Oh, well, this is, uh, here's the one here, I mean, it's I think the top of the list. Time. I've been in a lot of different places, uh, flew in uh, Iceland for a couple years, the Sierra Nevadas, uh, even New England, on the green pit for the year, uh, but there's no comparison. Each one has, you know, a certain something, of course, but uh, obviously for beauty, and uh, I guess we could say almost danger, this is, this is certainly the top of the list. Now we'll be climbing up here in just a moment uh, over the canyon to an altitude of 7,500 feet. As we go out over the Grand Canyon, we'll be about 1,000 feet above the south rim. And a little over 5,000 feet above the, uh, the river here as we start to cross. So as you look down, we're one mile above the river. The off rim is on an average about 1,500 feet higher than the south, as you'll see when we make our turn over the tail of the dragon up here. It gets about twice as much rain and probably three times more snowfall. Um, because of that, and because of the altitude, there are a much greater variety of uh, vegetation. The trees, uh, of course, uh, more a variety of those also. Over here we have Douglas spur, Norwegian blue spruce, white pine. Lots of ponderosa, of course, since this is the largest ponderosa pine forest. Um, some of the animal life is quite different as well. A rather unique squirrel lives over on the north rim, known as the kaibab. Kaibab is an Indian word, by the way, that means the, the mountain lying down. You may or may not know the north rim's closed in the winter because of all that snow. Usually late October until sometime in May uh, to vehicular traffic. I mean, you can bring your snow out we'll there, I guess, and your skis if you want to. But um, it is less accessible and only accessible from the northern part up here to Utah. If you drive in from the south, it's a good four-hour drive around to get to the north rim. Now, this uh, we're over the, the uh, Crystal Creek right now. And uh, from rim to rim at this point is the widest point of the Grand Canyon. It's almost 18 miles. but helicopter rides don't come exactly cheap. But my advice to you is save up for it for your trip here to the Grand Canyon because it's really worth the view. Especially if you've got kids. Especially yeah. if you're traveling with kids. <laughs> now stay right there. We've got a mule ride and some exciting Indian ruins coming up after this break. So don't go away. We'll be right back on Side by Side. Come on, kids. Let's get out of the way. back to the Grand Canyon. Chris and Linda Lewis taking a family vacation with our niece and nephew on this side-by-side. -side. And you know, it's getting more and more popular these days for the extended family to take vacations together. In other words, grandparents taking their grandchildren on vacation with them, and aunts and uncles like Linda and I taking our nieces and nephews with us when we go travel. And it's great fun. It not only gives family members who aren't together very much a chance to get to know one another, but it gives mom and dad a great break from the kids every once in a while. And on this trip, Brian and I have decided that we're going to do one of the most popular things here in the canyon, take a mule ride down to the bottom. Are you ready? 
You bet. Okay. Laura and I decided we're going to see the famous Tusian Indian ruins, and I bet your trip's going to be a little harder on the hiney than ours. <laughs> I bet it'll be just as fun. Yeah, Ready to get on that mule? Yes. Yeah. All right, Have well, fun, boys. Dave Tool is going to give us our little pep talk. Yeah, good. And we'll see you in a moment. All right, see you later. Okay, bye-bye. As you come in the round corral this morning to get your mule assignment, your guide's going to hand you a whip. Keep that whip wrapped around your wrist at all times today. If that animal you're sitting on slows up any at all, we want you to reach back and swat him on the backside with that thing as hard as you can. Guide does not want to look back there today, so using that thing as a fly swatter. It don't cut it, folks. These are 1,200-pound flies. You got to use a little authority on them down there today. Main reason we have this rule. If that animal you're sitting on down there gets 15 or 20 feet behind the one in front of you and all of a sudden he or she decides it's time to catch up by themselves, it's very likely they're gonna trot to do so. Now folks, number one, it's not physically good for an animal to be trotting them downhill if you can possibly avoid it. Number two, and even more important, about 90, 95% of you all that's going on this ride today have never ridden before or ridden very little. If you fall in that category, it's not physically good for you to be on an animal trotting downhill, okay? Well, it looks like they're having fun on that mule trip, but we've got more sure footing here, don't Definitely. we? Definitely. We're at the Tusian Ruins with Bob Audrich, and this is fascinating out here. What kind of Indians lived here, Bob? Well, we had a, quite a complex culture living here. As you can see, they had uh, rooms, although kind of small, and we just have some of the remains of them here. But these people came here in 1185 A.D. They only stayed here for about 20 or 30 years, and then we think they moved off to the east and probably uh, went to the Hopi Mesas and be, are now what we call the Hopi Indians today. Why would they have moved off so quickly, do you think? Well, we don't know all the reasons. We think that because there was a drought, and we think that they may have exhausted a lot of the environment, uh, used up most of the wood, and uh, hunted all the animals away. Along with the drought at the same time, that was probably enough to get them to leave here. We have a very, very small amount of rainfall, only about 14 inches of rain per year here, so just even a small reduction in that uh, would have uh, made them move on. Well, right over here we have the remains of what we call today the kiva. And, of course, this would have been a room with a roof on it made of logs and mud. And we believe this is where they had various religious ceremonies. All of the men here in Tucson, Puebla would gather and uh, have particular specialized religious ceremonies depending on the season of the year. Uh, the crops that were being harvested, and so on. How come it was only for men? Well, we believe that the people that lived here, uh, their uh, descendants are the Hopis, and among the Hopi, traditional Hopi, it is a matriarchal society. Uh, the women control everything. When a man gets married, he goes to the women's house, and we believe these people had very, very similar customs. What a good adventure, huh, kids? Wasn't it Great, a lot of fun? I loved it. Now, Brian, of our whole trip to the Grand Canyon, which part did you like the best? Well, I liked the mule ride, but the train was the best. Yeah, right. I agree with you. I love the train. Laura, what about you? My favorite was definitely the helicopter. The helicopter, yeah, that, that would come in second yeah. to it me. It was pretty awesome. <laughs> right. And that's about it for this trip, exploring one of the Earth's great wonders, the Grand Canyon. Now, if you'd like to know more about vacationing here, remember, the park is crowded and waiting lists for hiking, camping, lodging, and trips down into the canyon itself are long. So be sure and plan well in advance and be patient. For more information, you can contact the park superintendent at P.O. Box 129, Grand Canyon, Arizona, 86023, or contact your travel agent for more information. And if you'd like to contact us, 
It's simple and easy. Just write us. We'd love to hear from you. Our address is Side by Side, care of TNN Viewer Services, 2806 Opryland Drive, Nashville, Tennessee, 37214. We'd like to leave you now with the saying by John Wesley Powell, one of the first white men to explore the canyons. He said of the canyon itself. That's right. He said this, Brian. He said, one might imagine that this was intended as a library of the gods, and so it was. He who would read the language of the rocks would read in a slow and imperfect way so as to understand just a little bit better the story of creation. Oh, that's lovely. Isn't, isn't that right? nice? I loved it. It fits well, this beautiful yeah. place. Doesn't it? It's wonderful. Well, listen, we'll see you next time we go traveling side by side. Bye-bye. So long now.